go. I'm already a girl, I don't need Bud Light. Yeah. <laughs> Third one is they put a bullet in your head. So we're gonna have to see how the second life plays out. Obviously they attempted to cancel me. I became more famous than ever before. PB, what was your biggest takeaway from your interview with Andrew Tate? Well, it's cracking everybody. Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapali here. Hailing to you from the Money Smart Guy compound here at our home here in Frisco, Texas. And how fitting and appropriate it is for me to do this reaction video to Andrew and Tristan Tate from my house since uh, Andrew and Tristan Tate are under house arrest in Romania and doing an exclusive interview, the second ever done after his release from prison, from both of them released from prison, is my mentor and CEO of our firm, Patrick McDavid, also CEO of Value Tainment. And uh, it's interesting in this video, I did a FaceTime with Patrick McDavid about his biggest reaction to the interview. So make sure you stay tuned here to the end of the video to check it out. So a lot has changed since the last time we sat down with Andrew Tate. Last time we sat down with him, uh, you were the most uh, Googled man on earth. Uh, today, effective last two days, you are now the most Googled woman on earth. Correct. According to your Twitter profile. Correct. And uh, uh, we wanted to make sure after the BBC interview, you made certain requests. Yeah. You said you want moving forward there to be a $50,000 fee when people sit down to do an interview. So we wanted to make sure the ESG score for this interview <laughs> would be score. very high. We got you a $50,000 Target gift card. I appreciate that very much. For people Thank in you. America will appreciate Perfect. I need that. A whole new wardrobe and then now. you also said cookies. So Adam got you some taste cookies Amazing. to make sure yes. we match that. And then we, we one did, for your brother as well. We I did bring a Bud Light, yes. but unfortunately, Vinny finished it on the way here, Vinny. <laughs> you know, we. we uh, I'm already a girl. I don't need Bud Light. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, all right. If you didn't sense the shots that Patrick just sent out to corporate America and this politically correct and corporate America ESG score, ESG stands for Environmental Society and Governance, which is basically a corporate America social credit score about whether or not certain companies get public funding, investments from different institutions. So that's obviously a shot to the credit score, social credit score of the ESG and the, and of course the DEI and the CEI and also a shot from Andrew Tate talking about I'm the most Googled woman on earth because previous to the interview, he also identified, re-identified as a woman just to see what the social Twitter feeds would do. An obvious shot to the powers that be and they're doing their part to say, you know what? Uh, jokingly, they're laughing about it, but at the same time too, there's a sense of seriousness behind their statements. How do you feel with everything that's going on? And tell us a little bit about your current state today. Yeah, there's a very strange sense of terror that comes from knowing exactly what's gonna happen to you. There's a strange sense of calm that comes from it also, but in the middle of the night when you can't sleep, sometimes you feel happy knowing what they're trying to do to you and sometimes you feel terrified knowing what they're trying to do to you. I think I'm very happy Every single podcast I did previous to this, I hammered the point home and I made it very clear that they had the intention of trying to put me in jail. I said, there's three lives. They try and cancel you and slander you and destroy your name. They don't just want you to disappear from the internet. They want you to disappear from the internet in a cloud of shame. They have to shame you, which is why they chose the crimes they did for me. And it's why they usually choose the crimes they choose because it's heinous. They want to shame you and they want you to disappear with your head facing the ground and never pop up again. Obviously, they attempted to cancel me. I became more famous than ever before. I even said to you on your podcast, and I said on other podcasts, I said, I think they made a mistake. I think when you have power and you overuse it, you, what happens is a rebellion. That's how a revolution starts. When you have power, you have to be very, very careful with how you use that power. The second you overuse it, there's a re revolution. Like, and we're in Romania, so they know all about that. That's exactly what happens. And I, I said at the time, I think I was a mistake. I think they made a big mistake canceling me the way they did. That's the world we live in today. The craziness, the confusion. And by the way, I'm a believer. And there's, if, if you read the Bible, there's actually two fathers. There's actually Father God, who many believers feel that's Father God. It is the God of I am. The God that brings light. But also there's another father, if you continue reading the Bible. It's also the father of lies, the father of confusion. Who is that? And that's the enemy. And so right now, there is a definite struggle in power, spiritual war, according to Ephesians 6, 10, a, a, a spiritual war that's going on in America, in the world, because a lot of people today are confused about who they stand as a man, who they stand as a woman, who they stand as a family. Now there's confusion. And so Andrew's pushback on everything that's been going on has been articulated through his podcast. And now be, being him being the chess player, He's identified these moves, not for him, but also against him. He's obviously articulated moves for him, which got him to be the most Google man on earth. But now he's also identifying the moves that are going against him. And he's feeling a little bit of euphoria here, knowing that it may not be for the best. And then the second time, the second life, which I described is they try and put you in jail for no reason. 
here we are in the current scenario. I knew it was going to happen. And the third one is they put a bullet in your head. So we're going to have to see how the second life plays out. And huh. yeah, wow. I mean, when this is all over and I win the court case and I get the not guilty, I, I won't be smiling. I'll be walking out the courtroom with my head on a swivel. <laughs> That's the kind of life I'm living now. I'm going to be thinking, oh, OK, so their second attempt failed. Now what? Like, do I want to fly private anymore? <laughs> do I want to go that place anymore? Do I, you start to think yeah, who about you these trust? things. Like, do I want to do these things? A lot of billionaires die, dying in plane crashes. It's strange. So it's scary, regardless of how it plays out. And I guess you just have to go with the punches and, and, and see where it lands. And God has a plan for, for me and for all of us. And we're just going to see how it ends. Amen up. to that. Full disclosure, you don't have any suicidal thoughts. I want to make it very clear, and I make it clear on absolutely every single podcast, I would never kill myself. I don't care what they say. I don't care what video they show you. Never under any circumstance would I kill myself. It's haram. Never. I don't care if they put me in back in the dungeon, solitary confinement by myself for the rest of my human years. I would never kill myself ever, ever. So if that ever happens, God forbid, do not believe whatever garbage they tell you. The chance of me killing myself is precisely zero. Uh, is he giving a shot here to what happened in the Epstein case? So what Andrew's basically saying is, listen, if you didn't hear it clearly from him, I want to live my life. I want to make a difference. I want to raise my family. I love my my children, I love my purpose. And a lot of, I believe, of who Andrew is today and who Tristan is today has to do a lot with the impact of their father in their lives. And so what we don't have today is the impact of many fathers in their children's lives. And so Andrew's saying here, what happens when weak men start taking over, tough times begin. So I, I don't like the idea of my life without masculine competition. That's what I'll always say for my brother. And if you met a girl one day who says, Tate, I want to have, have your babies live with you. But it's kind of weird that your brother's here. What would you say to her? Yeah, a few of them have said that. I offer some degree of compromise. I'm like, look, we can have our own house separate if you really want, but I'm going to be spending a lot of time at that other house, including nights over. I want to stay with where my brother is. So you would compromise is. a little bit, but he's going to be living next door or with you. 100%. One of and the I don't four. think, and that may be unusual in the Western world. I don't think that's unusual in many places. I love that, by the way. Well, you talk Just about so this you, all the time. Oh, you don't even know yeah. how much I love that. Yeah, I love that. To me, that as a kid, that was a dream. Like, if you could, you know, write next to each other, uh, live next, there's a family in our community, a uh, billionaire family. They live right next to each other. The, the oldest son has the biggest house, 12,000 square feet. Then the youngest son has the second biggest house, 8,000 square feet. And the parents live in a 6,000 square foot house, right next to Absolutely. each other. Absolutely. Okay? The two boys have four kids. The eight kids are always together. Absolutely. What a great environment. Absolutely. It's a dream environment. By the way, it's a dream environment too, for me too as well. I'd love to buy a subdivision where all of our family are living in a cul-de-sac, living in a compound, living down the street from each other. And best yet, our backyards are connected. So therefore our kids, without having to go to the front yard, they can go through the backyard, interconnect to the backyard, through the fence, whatever the case may be, and have one big happy family get together. And all I gotta do is, is call down to my sister's house and say, hey, are my kids there? Great. Are we having dinner at your house or my house? What a great situation that would be. Families live together. Families built business together. They built farms together. They built trades together. And uh, uh, why shouldn't families be together? What are your thoughts? Should families be together or apart? I can't see how a person wouldn't buy into that, the benefits of it. And, um, and there's also benefits to the relationship because I, I think you have a better relationship with your woman if she can go and talk with other women and be with women and I'm with guys and, and, and I agree. together sometimes yeah. and split it up. It's better for everybody. Yes. This whole idea of, the, of, of just man, woman, boom, child bang, I understand where it's come from. I'm not saying it's all typically bad, but I do think that in those scenarios, there's a lot of men who are particularly miserable, particularly men, especially. And the idea of a clan and having that team around you, I love that. I wouldn't live any other way. I love living that way. By the way, when I was in, even when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, we'd celebrate when we're about to go on deployment. We'd celebrate when we got back from the deployment. We'd celebrate in between. We'd hang out with each other. That was the brotherhood. That's what we that's what we thrived on. That when we were deployed, our wives would be able to lead on the other wives. Now, obviously, during deployment, the brothers would hang out with each other in combat, down range, armed up, ready to rock. We leaned on each other. That's family. You have two families. The family that you're birthed with, family of origin, the second family is you have a family of choice. Best part of you weren't raised in a family of, of origin and people weren't close together. Guess what? Now going forward, you have the opportunity to start walking lockstep with people that share your values, your principles, your work ethic, your vision, your destination. We're about to head. We're about to take your family. When I started dating my wife, that was what I was talking about. It wasn't about the money I had. 
wasn't about my status. It was like, babe, this is what I want to do with a small last name. And if you were to come into my family, if you're going to come into our household, raise a blended family together, you're my three kids, you're one kid. Now we have a kid together. We're going to create an awesome family together. I was selling her on my vision of what a family is supposed to be. Of course, over 90s R&B ballads. Oh, yeah. You know, the American friends, they just move out, move on their own. That's what they do. But in Latin culture, the abuela's living in the house. The sure. family's living in Filipino there. house, the, same the way. The women are all kind of well, congregated we could, yeah, together. We could also it's a do, different world. We can also discuss it financially, right? If, if, if you're a man and a woman and you have three boys and they're, let's say, traditional Western, whatever, they all go and pay three different rents and they all move in with their girlfriends and everyone's getting wrecked, right? If Correct. you all stay together and combine your income, you also do much better financially. This is how a lot of immigrants even survived, especially Muslim immigrants in England. By the way, in Chicago, that's what we have. In Chicago, we had one family buying a three flat building or four flat and different families will live in the same flat and the same unit, okay? so combining their financial resources, building equity in that house together, and then when it's time to sell the property or time to refinance the property, they split up the equity with inside the family members between the different flats. Whatever financial contributed to their mortgage and the upkeep of the property, were able to share the equity in the property if they were to sell it or refinance. Yeah, they all stay together in one big house. They all pool their incomes. You have a bunch of people with average jobs and Ferraris on the drive. And then they buy the house they're in, then they buy another. You pool the incomes. If you all split and separate and just spread out, you're just paying all different rents, all different electricity bills, and you just go broke. You have to think of the last name and the generation and the clan and yep, the whole. Exactly. So yeah, I love the idea of living with my brother. I'll never live without him. And it, yeah, his woman can move in, of course. His kids can be around me, of course. I'm uncle, why not? There's the saying, goes around, comes around. Completely true. But I would say it comes from God. God is keeping an eye on you and he's paying attention to you and he knows the kind of person you are and the kind of things you do. And I don't believe if you're actually genuinely a good person all of the time, that you're not gonna get some good will back to you. Look at my scenario. If I was being a piece of shit for years with all these chicks, I'd be in jail. I'd be in jail. I could have never seen this coming. But the fact that I was nice, paid their taxi home, bought them food, looked after them. Are you okay? I know we broke up. I'm sorry. I know it hurts. I just did it. I was nice about all of it. Here I am. I'm fine. And so I could have never seen this matrix attack coming. It's amazing how what goes around comes around. It's truly amazing. If you're good to people, if you're generous to people, if you're helpful to people, you'd be amazed how much influence you can build up. When you're building a market, when you're building a reputation in your early 20s and 30s, do your very best not to ruin your reputation. It's like you taking a girl on a date and uh, you did her wrong. And next thing you're gonna go to a restaurant with your new chick and you end up in the same restaurant as your ex, she's there with her boyfriend and what she's gonna do to your girl. They meet in the bathroom, she shit talks you in the bathroom, ruins your date, talks about what you used to do, how you did it, ruins your chances with this new girl that you're dating. Next thing you know, she comes back to the bathroom, she goes, this date's over, I'm gone, I'm out. Why? Because you burned a bridge with your ex. So what Andrew Tater's talking about, listen, if the, all these allegations are true, how can we, I don't have thousands of women coming out of the woodwork coming against me. The, the saying goes, actions always supersede allegations. I think the universe is absolutely and utterly giving. When I see somebody who says they want something and they don't have it, I don't even think they truly even want it. You can have anything you want in the world. Amen. When a guy goes, I want a six pack, then why ain't you got one? Go in, hit the gym. If you want Red it. Red diet, right exercise. You'd like it. There's a bunch of things I'd like that I don't have. Sure. But I don't want them. Everything I've ever wanted, you work towards. I've got. Come on. I've never wanted something and not had it. We all know what we're talking about here. There's things we'd like. I'd like to be able to figure skate. Not enough to go learn to figure skate. It's but, a weird look if you figure out, although that other guy <laughs> dancing like the way you dance is doing a pretty the good bottom job. G. Bottom G, <laughs> yeah. seen this. By the way, before we get to bottom G here in a second, I think I know where they're going with this. But think about this. You can't be upset not having an extraordinary life because you put in an ordinary effort. Are you interested in it or are you committed to it? Are you willing to do the work or are you just still reading the brochure? Asking for more information, but not actually executing on the information. But if you truly want something, you're gonna yeah. absolutely not have it. So when it comes down to influence, I think you start at the, at the base level, at the grassroots level. What if I, what if this guy's got like, you know, for example, like, you know how, um, when you were 20, yeah. were you this driven? Oh, absolutely. Okay, just, so when you're 20, who did you look at and say, I can do it as good as him, if not better. My coach, because I wanted to fight, and he used to kick, he used to beat me badly. Everyone used to beat me up when I was young, and I wanted to be the best, so I used to go into the fight gym. Okay, how about communication? Who'd you look at? Were you always a good communicator? I can see you being a great communicator since you were 14 years old. My, my pretty... I was pretty good, yeah. Okay, who did you look at and say, 
I guy's good, but I think I can, you know, do it better. That's a good question. And I think that... You know what I'm asking. I right? know what you're asking. I, I don't know if there's one particular person I took nuances from, because when you're a great communicator, you know how to be serious, and you know how to make people sad and angry, and you also know how to people make people laugh. There's different people who can do lots of different things. So who things. was that? Was it somebody that was multifaceted like that? I, I think it was a lot of different people. And I also think that... Did you pull from comedy as well, or I no? I certainly did, but I was also extremely self-critical. I think that's where a lot of it came, comes from. I'll watch, I'll watch this podcast back 15 times. I will notice every single time I made a mistake. Just then I said, I'll watch twice. That was a mistake. I will watch this back 15 times and I'll identify every single error. I have uh, an email list and I sign up and I get words of the day. I get five or six new words a day, which I try my very best to memorize. It's harder than you think to memorize five words a day, but I always try to make sure I have Damn. the most interesting vernacular Damn. I can possibly have. Think about that. That's a discipline and a half. Points. Try one. The reason I actually did that, my, my, I keep talking about my dad, but he, he taught, he, I'm his son. I have the same name, Emory Andrew Tate III. He was Emory Andrew Tate II. My father was a linguist for the CIA. He spoke Russian and German and Spanish and English. And uh, I think I've told this before. Back then, when they needed someone who spoke Russian, they would take a Native American and teach them Russian. Nowadays, we have a bunch of Russian-speaking allies. So you can go to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. They're all NATO and just get a Russian speaker. Back then, they taught my dad Russian, and he held the Air Force record for the fastest assimilation of a foreign language. When he died, wow. a guy sent me an email sent me a message saying, you don't know who I am, but I worked with your father in the Air Force, and he had the fastest assimilation. He learned Russian. In Sheesh. Crazy. And I remember saying to my dad, will you teach me Russian? He said, boy, you don't even know English. <laughs> <laughs> so PBD, fresh from the Andrew Tate podcast, fresh from Armenia, unbelievable. PBD, what was your biggest takeaway from your interview with Andrew Tate? So biggest takeaway, um, was how united these two guys are, the two brothers are, how loose they are, how calm they are, how happy they are, yet how different they are. Andrew is more of the, you know, he may not use this word, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I would use the word paranoid, but he's more like the Andy Grove, only the paranoid survive. And Tristan is more the guy that's a, both of them are badasses, but in a different way. Tristan's like, Ain't nobody doing anything to us. I got your back. Let's roll. Let's go. No fear. Different dynamics. Um, you could tell, I mean, the part that I can't wait to release is the censored side, 45 minutes of it. Lawyers were there. Publicists flew in from all over the world. While we're doing the interview, what you don't see from this angle, what's out there is there's a group of people sitting there watching the whole thing, taking notes, huh. taking notes, taking notes. We have to cut this part. We have to cut that part. He told a story. I mean, this story may be one of the best stories I've heard what these guys did in, in jail. And the reason why they put them in the same room together, they immediately found out why they put them in the same room together. Once that thing is released, one of the stories on how he, <laughs> I mean, it's just too funny to even tell the story. I, it, it, the lawyers didn't want this thing to be released. But then the other part was more the humane side, you know, where uh, uh, while we're going through the deal, the podcast, um, we a Andrew's section was about seven hours from the beginning to the end. When we were done, it was seven hours. No eating. We just went straight through seven straight hours. Wow. The only thing we ate was maybe a protein bar, maybe a protein drink, maybe something like that. But aside from that, it was nonstop going through for seven hours. Let me go sit over here. And then on the other side, with Tristan, we went three hours. So between Andrew and Tristan, wow. we had a two-hour break where we had dinner. They cooked. Food was amazing. Their chef was insane. Like, <laughs> you know, heavy, massive tomahawks, you know, made in the way exactly I like it. And that time we sat there talking to one another. Just seeing the side of them that's just chill, relaxing, enjoying themselves. Yeah. And then afterwards, when we were done, we finished up at around 10 o'clock. You know, Adam, if any, wanted to go to uh, uh, do some research in the city. And they, they were asking Tristan. The libraries. Uh, the libraries. Yeah, and, yeah, and they, the, they wanted to go do some heavy duty research. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, no other, no better person to ask where to go do their researching than Tristan did. <laughs> Thank you.
I had played things my way since getting out of jail, me and Andrew would probably be back in jail right now. I'm censoring myself on this podcast, but the first day I, I got out, I thought, you know what, screw it. Let me just put a camera on, just tell the whole world what's going on, let them take me away live on stream. That's me. So <laughs> luckily he keeps me in check, 